Hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Attila Börötz. In cooperation with the Erasmus Plus program and the Hungarian Octopus Youth Association, we completed the solar energy course. Me and my colleagues were guiding you through the information you need to know about the sun and the solar energy. After watching the first 14 video chapters, actually the end of the course, I hope you understand our star and the energy it radiates. We were talking about a lot of aspects of this topic. This is the last chapter, so we will go through the whole course and stop at some point to review the most important information. These ones are fundamental to absorb the course and also a big help or successfully pass the final exam. So let's start. First of all, we were talking about the sun and its operation. So what do you see on this picture? This is the endless universe. This big dislike thing in the middle is the so-called Milky Way. On a moonless clear night, you can observe it with naked eye. In the middle, you can see, but there is the black hole. We are on the inner edge of the galaxy's Orion arm, around 25,000 light years from the center black hole. It is far away. Actually, one light year is 9.5 trillion kilometers. The white dots are stars like our sun. As you see, there are plenty of it. According to Wikipedia, there are around 100 to 400 billion in the Milky Way galaxy. So, what is the sun? The largest object in the solar system that provides heat and light for us. It is essential for almost all life on Earth. Its gravity and the rotation keeps all of the planets lined up in their orbits. Without the gravitation force, the planets would fly away, but without the rotation, everything would dive into the sun. Because its core has a big pulling force and her rotation, and because it has no solid surface, its shape is perfect sphere. As you see, the rotation period is 25, 33 days. It rotates faster at its equator than in its poles. At around almost 1.4 million kilometers wide, so the sun's diameter is about 110 times wider than Earth's. Its volume is more than 1 million times, and its mass is some 100,000 times of the Earth. The gravity on equator surface is 28 times the Earth's gravity. Just imagine it is 28 G. Its temperature is also incredible. Scientists determine that in the center, the temperature is 15 million Kelvin, and on the surface, 5 to 6,000 Kelvin, and the corona again, around 5 million Kelvin. On this slide, you can see the composition of the sun. Because of the excess heat in the sun, the elements have protons and neutrons, and one or more electrons are detached from the atoms. This is the so-called plasma state, where the substance is a mixture of plasma ions and free electrons. The two main elements in the sun are helium and hydrogen. As you see on the diagram, the numbers differ from the chart. The hydrogen is 73%, but here is only 70 by mass. But all the sources you can find are a bit different in the numbers. The explanation is easy. The sun converts hydrogen to helium in its core, so the ratio of the two elements is continuously changing. It will be more and more helium and less and less hydrogen as we progress through time. Apart from hydrogen and helium, everything else are less than 2%. The sun is producing a big amount of heat and light, but how? It converts hydrogen to helium. The sun is very hot because fusion releases a great amount of heat. That is why the fusion is called a chain reaction. In other terms, it is a nuclear reaction inside the core. 
you can see below the chemical equation. On the left side, the input, four protons and four electrons, basically four hydrogen atoms. And on the right side, the output, the helium with four protons and with two electrons. It means two electrons less on the right side. According to the law of physics, the mass became energy. It has two forms, motion energy and gamma rays. The different properties of plasma, such as temperature and density, create various layers within the sun structure. We will revive now the structure of the sun from inside to outside. There are the core, then the radiative zone, then the convective zone, photosphere, chromosphere, and outside the corona. First, we will repeat the most important impulse about the core. The innermost 20 to 25% of the sun radius is the core, where the energy is created. Due to the intense nuclear fusion we discussed before, the temperature in the core is 15 million degrees. Then I mentioned the photosphere. Actually, this is the visible surface of the sun. This is the first layer of the sun atmosphere, which is the tiniest, only a few hundred kilometers thick. The energy produced in our star is radiated in this layer in the form of light. Here we can observe the sunspots. The temperature dramatically decreases here to about 6,000 Kelvin. The chromosphere is the middle layer of the sun's atmosphere. The temperature here increases to about 10,000 Kelvin. And this layer radiates the most of the sun's harmful ultraviolet waves. Our sun is a second or third generation star. This means the solar system was formed from the interstellar gases of the universe and the remnants of its former stars, which were destroyed as supernova. It happened approximately 5 million years ago. In the present, in her active stage, it producing energy for us. After running out of fuel, it will stop producing energy, but this will be approximately 5 million years from now. This will be her passive stage. On this slide, you can see the whole stellar life cycle. On the beginning, there is the molecular cloud. Then there are forming massive stars, the line is above, and low mass stars in the middle as our sun. From the massive star, after its active stage, became a giant red star and later a supernova. Its remnant will be either a black hole or a neutron star. Our star will become a red giant. Then the outer layers become a planetary nebula and the core will be a white dwarf. After cooling down, it becomes a black dwarf. So we know already where the light is coming from. Now let's see its properties. The light or the energy, actually the whole solar spectrum is an electromagnetic radiation. What we call visible light is only a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Electromagnetic spectrum is a range of all types of electromagnetic radiation based on the wavelength and frequency. The lower the frequency, the longer the wavelength and vice versa. This inverse relationship can be seen on the left side. In one direction, the wavelength, and the other direction, the frequency is increasing. And with the frequency, the energy is increasing as well. So gamma rays has much bigger energy than the radio waves. Actually, as we discussed before, the visible light is only a part of the spectrum. We see it as a white light, but it is not white, but the mixture of seven colors of the rainbow. 
It is quite easy to see them, just we need a print. Here we can see the seven colors of the rainbow. Red, the orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Now I will talk about the factors determining the amount of incoming light. The sunshine is starting its long way from the sun to the earth. It takes about eight minutes and 17 seconds to travel the average distance, which is 150 million kilometers. The sunshine travels at a great speed in the deep space but the energy it carries decreases as it travels further away from the sun. As you see, our Earth gets 1,367 watts per square meter energy on the surface of its atmosphere. As it travels through the atmosphere, it loses some of its energy. A maximum 1,000 watts per square meter is reaches the surface. Let's see. What are the causes of the energy loss? These are the reflection, the absorption, and scattering. Every point on the Earth gets sunlight for at least a part of a year. The amount of solar radiation reaching any point of the Earth's surface depends on, first of all, the geographical position, then the season, the relief, in other terms, the angle of the incidence of the sunshine and the light transmittance of the air, the clouds and atmospheric conditions. Let's talk about the importance of sunlight in the life of plants. At first, we should clarify what photosynthesis means. Photosynthesis is a process used by plants and other organisms to convert light energy into chemical energy that can later be released to fuel the organism's activities. Most plants, most algae and cyanobacteria perform photosynthesis. You see below how carbon dioxide, water and sunlight, the energy from the sun react to each other and create oxygen, water and carbon hydrate. Then carbon hydrates will transform into glucose. Some plants are not able to do this. For example, fungi, they are not plants actually, they don't have chlorophyll. We were talking a lot about the history of the whole topic. Joseph Priestley was a scientist who contributed to the discovery of photosynthesis. His experiments included placing a lit candle inside the closed yard. The flame quickly went out and Priestley concluded that the air inside the jar has been injured. He conducted similar experiments with mice and conducted that the mice also injured the air. Priestley later discovered the plants could be used to restore air. As you know, animals are not able to make photosynthesis. So from where they get energy for living? Of course, from the food. The energy of food comes from the sun. As we know, fishes, amphibians, and reptiles are ectodermic animals. That means their body temperatures are mostly determined by the temperature of the environment. Of course, sunlight affects the human bodies too. As you see, it has some positive and some negative effects. Before we started to evaluate the different techniques of using solar energy, we have had a look at the following expressions and their meanings, non-renewable energy and renewable energy. Non-renewable energy comes from sources that will run out or will not be replenished for thousands or even millions of years. Most sources of non-renewable energy are fossil fuels like coal, petroleum, and natural gas. Renewable energy 
is the energy that is collected from renewable sources, which are neutrally replenished on a human tide scale, such as sunlight, wind, rain, tides, waves, and geothermal heat. Renewable energy, often referred as a clean energy, comes from natural sources or processes that are constantly replenished. Somewhere in the middle of the course, we were talking about the two main ways for using the solar energy. So what is the difference between solar thermal energy and solar PV energy conversion? First, let's see the left column solar thermal energy conversion. It heats water and living spaces. Solar thermal energy is indirect method of power conversion. It is used to heat up some fluid to generate mechanical power, which is in turn produces electricity. However, mostly we use it directly, requiring only the heat. Solar PV energy on the right side is the direct conversion of solar radiant energy into electrical energy. It is uses the photovoltaic effect. There are plenty of methods for using solar thermal energy. First of all, we can separate the home and industrial applications. Home applications are solar space heating, solar or water heating, pool heating, greenhouse production, passive house heating, and solar cooking. Industrial usage technologies using concentrated solar power. They are parabolic tube, dish stirling, solar power tower, and freshener reflector. Solar energy can be broadly categorized as active or passive solar energy, depending on how they are captured and utilized. In active solar energy, special solar heating equipment is used to convert solar energy to heat energy, whereas in passive solar energy, the mechanical equipment is not present. We were also talking about the basic principles of heat. Heat is simply a form of energy associated with the motion of molecules. When the electromagnetic waves coming from the sun hit an object, they excite the molecules of that object, causing them to move. This molecular movement is heat. Heat is always moving from higher to lower temperatures until the temperature differences are equalized. They are the three basic physical ways that heat moves, the conduction, convection, and radiation. We have seen the water, air heating systems. All systems start with the collector. On this slide, we can see the components of a liquid heater collector. The cover, tubes, pins or passages for conducting or directing the heat transfer fluid, black absorber plate, insulation, container or casing. All has its own role, but I don't want to spend more time to repeat it. After the water heating applications, we covered the solar air heating applications and medium temperature solar heat collectors as well. This heating system using instead of some kind of fluid, but air to transfer heat. Solar air heaters are mostly used in domestic space heating. Solar air heat is also used in process applications such as drying laundry, crops, for example, tea, corn, coffee, and other drying applications. They reach heat between 125 and 400 Celsius. They are easy to build, but they are not as efficient as water heat collectors and thus require a large area for the required heats. The next type of systems we were described are the high temperature systems. This type of collectors creating heat as well, but sometimes the heat is further developed into electricity. 
the reference of high temperature solar thermal energy to the solar system that use solar collectors that work at temperatures above 500 Celsius degrees. The technologies using concentrated solar power are parabolic through dish sterling solar power tower and freshener reflector. We detailed all of them. After the solar thermal, we turn to the most common photovoltaic systems. As you see on this slide, a basic photovoltaic system consists of some important components. We were explained this system in detail, so I will just quickly repeat it. First in the system is the solar panel, where the solar energy is converted into electricity. Most of the electrical devices uses not direct current, but alternating current, so the DC has to be converted to AC, which is the task of the inverter. This is actually one of the most expensive parts of the system. The AC coming out from the inverter can be used for house applications, or if there is an excess amount of it, it can be sold and sent back into the electric grid. We were talking a lot about the basic of the solar system, the photovoltaic cell. These cells are devices that convert solar radiation into direct current electricity. Because the source of the radiation is usually the sun, they are often referred as solar cells. Nowadays, the most common solar cells are silicon based. So this is the basic component of a most of solar cells. On this slide, we can have a closer look to the silicon atom. It belongs to the metalloid or semiconductor element category. Its atomic number is 14, which means it has 14 protons and the same amount of electrons. In the ground state, the electrons are arranged in different shells. As you see, two fills the first, eight the second, and four are occupying the third shell. Silicon comes from the sun, so we have a very abundant source of it. Pure silicon alone is not enough in a solar cell because pure silicon has low semiconductor value. So we will need two other elements that are close in their electronic structure to silicon. These are the phosphorus and the boron. In the crystal of the phosphorus atom is called an electron donor because it donates an extra negative electron to the silicon crystal. The N stands in the N type for negative. Because the phosphorus atom has one more proton than silicon, it has a net positive charge. A boron atom is called an electron acceptor because its excess amount of hole. Here, the P in P type stands for positive hole. Because the boron atom has one less proton than silicon has, it has a net negative charge. Here, we can quickly summarize the operation of the solar cell. At the point when protons hit the solar cell, if it has the right amount of energy, it pops free an electron. So the N type, which is located above, as free electrons in the atomic structure, and the p-type located below has free spaces or holes for electrons. Therefore, when they are put together, an electrical field is produced by the free electrons in the n-type silicon going to fill the gaps in the p-type. Then because of the electrical field, an electron will flow between the n-type and p-type, creating voltage and current and hence electrical power. The common single junction silicon solar cell can produce a maximum open circuit voltage of approximately a half volt. The electrons and the charge flow in the opposite direction of the convectional electric current. The charge from positive to negative, the electrons from negative to positive. Solar cells are not usually used individually because they do not output sufficient voltage and power to meet typical electrical demands. 
the amount of voltage and current they output can be increased by combining cells together with wires to produce larger area solar modules. Cells can be connected in a number of ways. Strings, for example, where cells are connected in series, the blocks, two or more strings connected together in parallel, and finally, joining two or more blocks together. The series connections increase the voltage output and parallel connections increase the current output. So normally, we're combining the two connection methods to reach the desired output. As you see, there are plenty of solar technologies. On this slide, you can see only the most common ones. Most probably, when you watch this video, there are already some new concepts. First, we discussed the most common group, the silicon cells. This group can be further divided to crystalline and thin film silicon cells. These also have subcategories like single and polycrystalline cells. The second big group contains the thin film technology cells. And finally, the third generation solar panel cells you can see on the right side. This group is a continuously expanding one, so it is impossible to evaluate all the variants in it. On this slide, you can see the types of crystalline silicon. These types were the first we discussed in detail. Different levels of crystal structure may exist, ranging from single crystal to totally non-crystalline. The different type of silicon cells are single crystal silicon, multi or polycrystalline silicon, ribbon silicon, and finally the amorphous silicon, which is more with the green dot to indicate that actually it is a silicon-based thin film technology. Since the monocrystalline silicon is pure and defect-free, the efficiency of the cell will be higher, its lifespan longer, but also this is the most expensive. A thin film solar cell is still in a developing stage of technology and innovation. In a thin film cell, the semiconductor layer is only 1 to 10 microns compared to 200 to 300 microns in the crystalline versions. Their advantages are, as you see, are plentiful. Among the disadvantages, there is that to manufacture good films is difficult and therefore they show lower efficiencies, somewhat better in low light conditions. After the normal one junction cells, we were talking about the multi junction solar cells. Each junction or subcell absorbs and converts sunlight from a specific region of the spectrum. The subcells can be stacked on top of another so that sunlight first strikes the highest band gap subcell, which is tuned to the light with the shortest wavelengths or highest energies. This arrangement offers a significant advantage over single junction solar cells, which have a maximum theoretical efficiency of only 33%. In theory, an infinite junction solar cell has a maximum theoretical efficiency of almost 90%. The last big group we were talking about were the third generation solar panels. This is a fast developing group, so we just highlighted some of them. First was the nanocrystal based solar cell, which has another name as quantum dots, where the semiconductor particles are a few nanometers in size. The biohybrid solar cells try to recreate the natural process of photosynthesis for energy generation. It has almost 100% efficiency, but shorter lifespan. Concentrated PV cells use lenses or curved mirrors, which focus sunlight into small multi-junction solar cells, so it is extremely efficient in good radiate conditions, but less effective in low-radiance areas. 
therefore it requires tracking. By developing the copper zinc thin sulfate, CZTS, the main goal was using earth abundant and non toxic elements. Another interesting type is the desynthetized solar cell, which use of liquid electrodes, photoelectrochemical cell, to transform ions to a counter electrode. Polymer solar cells are more economical, disposable, flexible in nature, and have less impact on the environment. Organic solar cell device or organic photovoltaic cell, OPVC, is a class of solar cell that uses conductive organic polymers or small organic molecules for light absorption and charge transport. By developing the colored panels, the aim was to improve the appearance of the system. We were talking about the losses which degrade the output values of the system. As you see, the losses can be categorized to optical and electrical losses. Electrical losses are beyond this course, but the other side is interesting for us. They reduce the level of solar radiation by reflection and shadowing of the irradiating light. Reflection and refraction are dependent on the angle of attack of the incident light. With a good tracking system, the refraction can be minimized and reflection can be reduced with a texturing of the surface or with anti-reflecting coating. At the front of the solar cell, there are metal contacts. They cast some shadows, so reducing its size have minimized the casted shadow but actually a bad placing of the system can cause more shadowing. An absorbed radiation can be minimized with multi-junction cells. We are trying to compare one PV panel to another. For this, we check the solar panel specifications that impact performance. As you see, there are lots of parameters categorized in two main groups. These are the mechanical specifications and electrical specifications. First, we will start it with the mechanical parameters. Solar cell type defines the type of module or cell used in the module. For example, monosilicium, polysilicium, or tin film. Second is the cell dimension. It defines the size of cell used in the module. The module dimension determines the number of cells accommodated in the module and the surface required for installing the panels. By the electrical specifications, I would like to highlight the two test conditions, the HTC and NOCT. The first refers to the optimal and the NOCT to the realistic conditions. Peak power defines the maximum power of the panel in watt, so it determines how many panels you need to reach the desired power output. We also tried to show you still not too common but promising solar applications like floating and agrovoltaic system. They have a big potential, so it expected that they will spread across the globe. Somewhere in the course, we dealt with using the solar energy in architecture. The pursuit of the use of solar energy is not new. It was self-evident even in the ancient times that this free energy can be utilized. It can be used for lighting and for thermal control. By lighting, the important factors are building orientation, a building platform, pleasing ratio, and window height interior color shading. We were talking about them in detail. To reach thermal comfort, you have to collect, store, and in time release the heat. 
For this, we have been talking about the five elements of passive solar design, about the aperture, collector, absorber, thermal mass, distribution, and contour. At the end of the course, I showed you some interesting projects. You can do it yourself. Most of them was built myself, as well with satisfying results. As you see, cleverly using some crabs, really effective devices can be made. So I hope you enjoyed the course and will easily pass the final exam. Bye.